Now I pass the floor to Vice President Dombrovskis for the College Readout. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So in today's uh, press conference, we'll concentrate on budgetary instrument for convergence and uh, competitiveness, as well as on anti-money laundering issues. But uh, let me uh, first uh, uh, point out some other items uh, which were in today's Commission's uh, agenda. Uh, today, the Commission has issued guidance on the participation of third country bidders in the EU procurement market. This uh, practical advice for public buyers in the member states will help them to, uh, 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 will help them to deal with uh, bidders from outside the European Union. This includes uh, clarifications on which third country bidders have secured access to EU procurement market and which companies may be excluded. <coughs> Uh, our guidance also aims uh, to raise awareness among the contracting authorities of the different instruments in the EU public procurement toolbox. This includes measures that may be taken in case of uh, abnormally low priced offers, as well as measures to ensure that third country bidders respect the same quality as EU bidders in areas such as uh, security, labour and environmental standards. Uh, the College also adopted the 19th report on the security union. I will not uh, say much uh, more on this uh, because Commissioner King will present uh, it to the Libe Committee in the European Parliament this afternoon. Now uh, moving to the uh, budgetary instrument on uh, com competitiveness and convergence. Um, Throughout this uh, Commission's mandate, we have been uh, working on deepening the economic and monetary union in order to make Europe's economy stronger and more resilient. In June, Euro Summit agreed on a package with a number of steps in that direction, such as an ESM reform and a backstop to the banking union to deal with the banking crisis should they occur. It also includes a budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness to help our economies converge upwards. Uh, today we are proposing a governance framework for a budgetary instruments for uh, convergence and competitiveness. This uh, complements our, aerial uh, our earlier proposal on the reform support program, which has served as a good basis for uh, discussions by the member states on an instrument of this kind. Uh, the uh, 27 member states in the inclusive Euro Summit decided that the new instrument should be available for the Euro a a area and uh, on a voluntary basis the ERM2 states and uh, that autonomy of the decision making for Euro area member states should be ensured. Uh, in June, ahead of the Euro Summit, the Commission announced its readiness to propose a new regulation on the basis of Article 136 of the Treaty in order to set up this governance framework within the existing EU treaties. Today, we are doing exactly that. The framework proposed is fully cons uh, consistent with our well-established European semester for economic policy coordination. Uh, so, how will it work? Uh, in short, the Euro area member states will set out annual strategic orientation for reform and investment priorities uh, for the Euro area as a whole. They will also provide country specific guidance for reforms and investment packages to be supported under the instrument. Uh, it's important to act now. Uh, we want ma to make sure that European Parliament and the Council have all the elements necessary for their work in order to finish on time for the next multi-annual financial uh, framework. Uh, Günther will speak more on uh, this uh, in a moment. Uh, we look uh, forward to the discussions in European Parliament and the Council. Once agreement is uh, reached, uh, I'm confident this instrument will uh, prove to be a valuable tool for making economic monetary union stronger and more prosperous. Um, today, we also adopted a communication on addressing money laundering and financing of terrorism, uh, together with a series of reports that assess risks and remaining uh, shortcomings. Uh, we have done a lot to put EU's financial sector on a more solid footing, uh, for instance, by strengthening the prudential requirements, and the work is still underway to complete the banking union and to create a, a true capital markets union. But a sound financial sector must also be built on the highest standards of integrity. Uh, serious money laundering scandals involving a number of banks have highlighted that Europe needs to do more on this. Uh, we, there must be no place for money laundering and terrorist financing in Europe's banks. 
In response to the call for, uh, from the EU finance ministers in December 2018, our services have analyzed what went wrong. Uh, as you know, Europe has uh, some of the toughest rules on money laundering in the world, and our rulebook is being further strengthened. Yet, today's analysis gives more proof that our strong AML rules have not been equally applied in all banks and in all EU countries. Uh, to give you a couple of concrete examples of what uh, did not work. Uh, what emerges is a picture of ineffective compliance or lack of compliance even when formal procedures are in place. This comes from staffing and uh, management capacity issues in some cases, but in many others, banks simply did not make compliance a priority. At the same time, as the report revealed an inconsistent report, response from supervisors in terms of timeliness, intensity, and in terms of measures uh, taken, again, there were staffing and capacity issues. Uh, an, uh, another issue that there, uh, there was that where credit institutions had cross-border operations, no one supervisor look, uh, 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 took responsibility for the group as a whole. Each supervisor focused on the local business in that member state. Uh, this points to the structural problem in the union's capacity to prevent the financial system uh, uh, that the financial system is used for illegitimate, uh, illegitimate purposes. Uh, since these cases happened, banks, supervisors, and the EU have taken a number of actions, most recently conferring additional powers to the European Banking Authority. Uh, our analysis uh, suggests that we should pursue the path towards more competence at the EU level and a single rulebook based on regulations rather than directives. Today's report prepares the ground for the new Commission to do so and to take further steps to improve consistent application of our rules and ensure strong cross-border coordination. Uh, today we also published uh, other reports related to Union's legal framework for, from uh, preventing money laundering and terrorist financing, as well as how it is being implemented, uh, where I will provide you with more details in a moment. Uh, let me just say that these important findings are of concern uh, to us and deserve further consideration. As such, they will feed into the decision-making process of the next Commission. Thank you. Okay, now Commissioner Oettinger to complete from the EU budget side. Meine Damen und Herren, mit Blick auf das Haushaltsinstrument für Konvergenz und Wettbewerbsfähigkeit will ich die Ausführungen des Kollegen Dombrovskis ergänzen aus der Sicht der europäischen Haushaltspolitik. Seit Jahren wird ja über die Frage beraten, ob die Eurozone für die stabile Entwicklung und für Handlungsfähigkeit weitere Instrumente bekommen soll. Von einem eigenen Eurozone-Haushalt völlig separat zum Haushalt der Europäischen Union bis hin zu Instrumenten innerhalb des Haushaltsrahmens reichten die Vorschläge. Die Junge Kommission hat mit ihrem Vorschlag für den mehrjährigen Finanzrahmen 2021 bis Ende 2027 aus unserer Sicht die Frage beantwortet und innerhalb des europäischen Haushalts ein spezielles Instrument für die Eurozone und die Eurozone-Mitgliedstaaten im Mai letzten Jahres vorgeschlagen. Das war ein Haushaltsinstrument für Konvergenz und Wettbewerbsfähigkeit. Es gab dann seitens Frankreichs sehr ehrgeizige Überlegungen und wir sind jetzt dankbar, dass es gelingen kann, die unterschiedlichen Ansätze in der Eurozone weitgehend auf der Grundlage des Kommissionsvorschlags nach vorne zu bringen. Es ging mir dabei immer auch darum, dass es zu keiner weiteren Verzögerung kommt. Wir bieten jetzt nämlich in die Zielgerade ein, um einen Haushaltsrahmen für das nächste Jahrzehnt möglicherweise noch in diesem Jahr abschließend zu beraten und zu verabschieden. Deswegen war mir immer sehr wichtig, dass dieses Eurozone-Instrument nicht zu einer zusätzlichen Verzögerung des Haushaltsrahmens führt, denn es soll ja Teil des Haushaltsrahmens sein. Heute nun haben wir 
mit Wissen und im Auftrag des Eurozonenrates, der Finanzminister und auch der Staats- und Regierungschefs in der Kommission den Steuerungsrahmen beschlossen, die Governance beschlossen, wie das Instrument in Zukunft genutzt werden soll. Ein Instrument, das Reformen unterstützen soll und das prioritäre Investitionen und äh, Investitionsprojekte kofinanzieren soll. Damit haben wir unsere Hautaufgaben äh, gemacht. Es liegt jetzt äh, am Rat und in den weiteren Beratungen zwischen Rat und Parlament über die Höhe zu entscheiden. Im Gespräch befinden sich derzeit für die sieb der sieben Jahre ein Gesamtbetrag von 17 Milliarden Euro. Der wäre in unserem Haushaltsrahmen ohne Probleme darstellbar, denn unser Instrument ursprünglich hat einen Umfang von 25 Milliarden Euro vorgesehen. 17 Milliarden in sieben Jahren sind ein, ich finde, beachtlicher Anfang. Ob und wann man diese Beträge steigern kann und wie dies dann geschehen soll, wie sie finanziert werden, bedarf der weiteren Beratung. Alles in allem ist damit für Oktober die Vorarbeit gemacht. Für Oktober, wenn auf dem Weg zum Oktober die Eurozone Finanzminister abschließend beraten und dann die Staats- und Regierungschefs hoffentlich Mitte Oktober sich mit Schwerpunkt dem Haushaltsrahmen annehmen, so wie dies in Ihrem Jahresprogramm vorgesehen ist. Besten Dank. Thank you, Commissioner. Now to Commissioner Jurova. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to come back to the anti-money laundering issue and the reports which we uh, presented today to the college. Uh, through the reports, we look at the anti-money laundering framework in the whole European Union in a systemic way to learn the lessons and address the shortcomings. We have a problem in Europe. Europol estimates that around 1% of Europe's wealth is involved in suspect financial activity. That's the equivalent of the annual EU budget. So what we did today is firstly to assess the risks. We identified that the biggest risks are linked to anonymous transactions like prepaid cards, to virtual currencies and lack of transparency on beneficial ownership. As a regulator, the Commission has already acted by strengthening the rules. We did the right thing as the fourth and the fifth anti-money laundering directives address these new risks we identified. Not all rules are applicable yet, as the latest update has to be transposed in January 2020 only. So I am not afraid to say that Europe has one of the strongest anti-money laundering rules in place. But then these rules also need to be vigorously enforced. We have used the past cases of money laundering scandals to look at the enforcement and the conclusion is that member states supervisors and financial intelligence units are not always doing enough, especially when it comes to cross-border cooperation. The money flows very easily between EU countries' financial systems, so should the information between financial intelligence units, but as I said before, this is not always the case. Also banks with branches in different member states were not well supervised as neither the supervisors in the host country nor in the country of origin would take the responsibility. So we conclude that the enforcement is not proactive and dissuasive enough. The banks also must do more. They were prioritizing some of their other obligations but didn't look closely enough where the money comes from, especially following the crisis. So we have tried to address this too by playing our role as guardian of the treaty and opening infringement procedures and by strengthening the role of the European Banking Authority by giving it the power to put in place a preventive and proactive supervision. The price of a failure is high and in each and every meeting I have with EU ministers on this issue, I am reassured that the political will is growing to tackle this issue. As the President-elect has indicated in her political guidelines, 
Supervision has to become more effective and remaining loopholes need to be filled. So I am sure the next Commission will continue to lead these efforts. Finally, there is also an important external dimension to our anti-money laundering toolbox, the identification of high-risk third countries. Following the rejection of the Commission's list by the Council this year in spring, we have worked on a refined methodology to address the concerns of the Member States. I will continue this work and will move it to the political level at the October ECOFIN Council. I will also discuss it with the European Parliament. We have also strengthened the Commission's activity in the Financial Action Task Force. In April, uh, this task force agreed on strategic review that will make its listing process more risk-based. And in June, just to remind you of the case of Panama, FATAF uh, added Panama to its list on high-risk third countries, confirming, in fact, the assessment we made in February. But I can share with you my feeling that's frustrating, this fact that the Council and the European Parliament take very divergent approaches on this issue. The effect is that we are lagging behind as our latest update to the list of high-risk countries comes from mid-2018. I am determined to find a solution and I am hopeful that we can reach the agreement that would defend the EU financial system from the risk coming from outside the EU. I also presented today the report on uh, the general data protection regulation. So if I can yes, of continue uh, of the into another topic. Uh, uh, as you know, we are one year after the direct application of our new data protection regime. It is time to assess where we are. There are three main conclusions from our assessment. One, data protection finally matters and people are starting to care about their privacy. Two, the EU is entering a digital era on a strong footing as data protection rules become an integral part of other policies, such as, for instance, on artificial intelligence. And three, beyond Europe, our data protection rules open up possibilities for digital diplomacy to promote data flows based on high standards between countries that share EU values. We need to continue our work for the GDPR to become fully operational and effective. This is what this communication is all about. We see that harmonization of data protection rules across the EU is progressing, but we, the Commission, have to be vigilant so the member states won't be tempted to take advantage of some specificities they could include in their national laws. We must avoid the so-called gold plating. The Commission will do its job on the, of the guardian of the treaties vigorously on this front. Then we see that the majority of the citizens know the rules. They know how to address them, their complaints to National Data Protection Authority. But we have to continue raising awareness so people get a better understanding of the risks, especially in the digital world. As for the businesses, it's true that today they complain much less as they see that the doom scenarios of last spring did not materialize. They start to see advantages such as increased security of data, lowering the costs of breaches, innovative privacy-friendly solutions, and finally, privacy by design as a competitive differentiator. More and more companies want to gain people's trust by respecting their privacy. But still, too many companies, especially small and medium enterprises, feel uncertain about the GDPR. That's why we continue to support the data protection authorities with funds for campaigns and why we urge the European Data Protection Board to step up work on facilitating life for business by using innovative solutions such as standard contractual clauses, codes of conduct or, or certification. This is a toolbox GDPR offers to help with compliance and create more certainty for companies. Finally, let me say a few words uh, about where we are with GDPR on the international stage. 
Indeed, uh, through GDPR, Europe became the rule maker for the world. And we can say today that GDPR has become a reference point of a modern and high digital standard. More and more countries in Asia, Latin America, or Africa are adopting new laws or changing their existing ones and are taking the GDPR as a reference point. This is a true example of the EU as a rule maker, which I mentioned before. Also, the adequacy agreement with Japan next to the trade agreement is also something that other countries want to replicate. I went to Chile and Argentina two weeks ago. Chile is working on the first ever comprehensive data protection law, taking inspiration from the GDPR, and wants to engage in adequacy talks as soon as possible. Argentina is also changing their law. This is important in the context of our trade agreements with both countries. In the future, and building on the Japanese idea of data flows with trust and on the Council of Europe Convention 108, I see scope for more multilateral rulemaking in the area of privacy rules in the digital world. And the EU can be and should be a leader in this process. We must not st stand still, however. This is why the communication contains a to-do list for everyone, for the Member States, for the European Data Protection Board, for the Data Protection Authorities, for the Commission. GDPR can only fully succeed if we have uniform application and robust enforcement across the EU and when we will develop an EU-wide culture in this area. If you remember, when we were adopting GDPR, we promised one law, one continent, and this has to be maintained. So this will also be an important contribution for the review of the GDPR, which the new commission will have to do in spring 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, commissioners and vice president. Let's see, uh, open the floor to questions. I had Jorge first. Good morning, Jorge Valero with your active. Two questions, one for, um, uh, well, two for Commissioner uh, Dombrovskis, uh, one of them might be also for uh, Commissioner Durova. On uh, the money laundering, uh, it seems that the EU, even though it's putting forward always new initiatives, is, goes one step behind. Uh, one of the issues discussed is having a pan-European authority to handle uh, anti-money laundering cases. So do you think that for the next commission, and you, uh, Vice President Dombrovsky, will be part of the next commission, uh, having this authority is a must, and not only limiting uh, having an harmonized uh, implementation of the new rules. And a second question also for uh, Commissioner Dombrovsky. Uh, uh, the public prosecutor in Spain has uh, filed charges against the BBVA, which is, as you know, the second largest uh, bank in Spain, uh, for other reasons, uh, illegal wiretapping. Um, so my question is whether are you concerned about uh, this, uh, this uh, situation, given that it's not only a systemic bank, but the second largest bank in Spain? And also, if you consider that the bank uh, should take a forceful action, given that uh, the governance is at stake and the whole entity has been, uh, yeah. Uh, put in, in uh, yeah, uh, file charges, fair face charges. Thank you. Uh, well, on the first um, uh, question <coughs> on uh, anti money laundering and uh, indeed uh, uh, putting more uh, authority at the EU uh, level, indeed, that's what our uh, communication uh, suggests that we should have a dedicated uh, anti money laundering uh, authority uh, in the EU. Uh, uh, we uh, do not uh, currently go in detail whether it's on the basis of uh, European banking authorities, which we already have uh, uh, assigned uh, more uh, uh, powers during the review of European supervisory authorities, or is it some uh, other institution. Uh, uh, so uh, we are in this sense not prejudging the work of the new uh, commission. We also outlined that for European uh, uh, authority to act more effectively, uh, it would be uh, helpful actually to have a single rule book based on uh, regulations instead of directives as it is uh, now, uh, because uh, then for European authority, it's easier to enforce European regulations than uh, national laws which are transposing uh, uh, directives. 
so we do, uh, uh, do hope, of course, that uh, this is going to be priority also for the next uh, European uh, Commission and that there is going to be follow-up on this uh, report. Uh, as, um, uh, as regards uh, BBVA, currently I don't have uh, much uh, comments uh, uh, to make as it is uh, uh, currently with uh, national authorities. Okay, that answered your question. No, you had one more that was not answered. Okay. Uh, it is not only a, a national authority competence because actually uh, as the single supervisor is uh, the ECB, I mean, uh, there is a pan-Europe, I mean, a European role here in order to play. And one of the aspects that the ECB and the super single supervisor monitors is the, the, the proper governance of the systemic bank. So I guess that either the ECB uh, single supervisor and the commission maybe have a word to say on what actions the ECB uh, board must take in order to ensure the proper governance. Well, at the current stage, as I said, there's not much comments and can make from uh, uh, European Commission side. ECB, as you know, is an uh, independent institution. In this case, you should address this question uh, to ECB. Okay, then I have Jim next. Thank you, thank you very much. Jim Brunston from the Financial Times. Um, actually, the first question is, is just a, a follow-up to Jorge's uh, question, actually. Is there scope for other authorities other than the EBA to, uh, to, to get involved with this? I mean, I think we've, we've seen recently what the limitations of the EBA are. I mean, frankly, it, it buried its own report into the Danske Bank's scandal, so it hasn't exactly covered itself in glory. Um, and secondly, on, on a different topic, uh, would it be possible to have some reflections from the commissioners present on the, uh, the, commissions, the commission's now departing Secretary General and uh, what they felt about his performance in office? Thank you very much. The first one. Uh, okay, so on uh, 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 which exactly European authority uh, uh, should it be uh, dealing with AML questions? Uh, as I said, our uh, communication leaves this question open, so we have identified this as a structural problem that enforcement, even though we have European rules and uh, uh, one of the strongest rule, uh, uh, rules, anti-money laundering rules uh, in the world, enforcement so far has been purely uh, national and very uneven. So we think that uh, uh, we can deal with this uh, assigning more uh, authority at the EU level. Uh, whether it's European Bank Authority or some other institution, uh, we uh, currently leave this issue open. Uh, as regards uh, European Banking Authority, and you mentioned the Bans uh, Danske ba uh, Bank uh, case, indeed, uh, we have also uh, voiced our disappointment of this uh, decision not to investigate the Danske Bank case. Uh, but uh, uh, it must be noted that when we were proposing the review of European supervisory authorities, uh, we were also proposing more far-reaching uh, uh, changes to the governance of European supervisory authorities to allow for more effective uh, decision-making. And maybe this Danske Bank case is uh, a good indication that we should come back to this question. Okay, and then uh, Commissioner Ettinger first on, the, uh, on our Secretary General. <coughs> Martin Seemeyer schaltet ja nicht aus der Kommission aus. Er geht für uns nach Österreich und wird die Europäische Kommission und damit auch die künftige Kommissionspräsidentin in einem wichtigen Mitgliedstaat äh, vertreten. Äh, seine Verdienste sind, glaube ich, über viele Jahre hinweg äh, eindeutig und klar. Er war im Kabinett von Frau Redding, er war dann ihr Kabinettschef. Er hat Jean-Claude Juncker ab dem ersten Tag in der Vorbereitung auf diese Kommission begleitet und war sein wichtigster Berater. Er war sein Kabinettschef und er ist unser Generalsekretär bis nächste Woche. Ich glaube, die fünf Jahre Jean-Claude Juncker-Kommission wären ohne seine Mitwirkung in der Form nicht denkbar. Ich habe eine positive Bilanz über das, was er in den letzten fünf Jahren und in den Jahren davor geleistet hat. Und jetzt geht er nach Österreich. Ich glaube, der Schritt ist nachvollziehbar und folgerichtig. Sobald klar war, dass äh, die nächste Präsidentin der Europäischen Kommission eine deutsche Staatsbürgerin ist, war es naheliegend, dass dann der Generalsekretär nicht die gleiche Nationalität haben sollte. 
äh, er hat Frau von der Leyen beraten, aber geht jetzt folgerichtig nächste Woche raus. Und ich glaube, ähm, die meisten sind ihm dankbar und die, die nicht dankbar sind, haben zumindest Respekt vor ihm. Okay, danke. Commissioner Jurova, you wanted to add something? I'd like to come back to the topic of the uh, money laundering and, and the European, possibly European supervisory body. At this moment, speaking about the European Banking Authority, uh, we see that they react exposed. Uh, upon request, they uh, investigated into two cases. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, also taking this lesson seriously, uh, we want the uh, EBA to have stronger powers to be able to collect the data, to, to make the early detection of some, some risky behavior, and to take proactive and, and preventive measures. And this could be even strengthened uh, in the future, as, as Valdis indicated. But uh, I think that taking lessons and, and looking for the solutions, we should be also a little bit creative and look into what are other capacities of, of the EU having uh, which we have in fight against financial crime. And uh, in my view, it would be uh, worthwhile thinking about the possible role of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, up to now, we spoke about preventive and, and proactive uh, work. But uh, when it comes to last resort action, which is criminal justice here, there the European Public Prosecutor's Office, the EPPO, should play more and more important role in the EU because this will be the pan-European uh, operating uh, body uh, in uh, playing very important role in fighting against financial crime. There will be capacities, uh, there will be prosecutors specialized on, on uh, financial crime and as such it could be a body which uh, could play a stronger role in uh, prosecuting the crime related also to money laundering. This is my personal view, this is how I see the situation. Of course, it will be for the next commission to look into this possibility. Uh, it will be for the European Parliament and member states in case such a, such a proposal would come in the future, uh, whether this would be practical and efficient. I want to uh, just to remind us of the fact that every uh, possible enlarging of the competencies of the EPPO would require unanimity from the side of the state, so very strong uh, common accord. Uh, but I do believe that it is uh, worth thinking about also not only preventive but also repressive side. Thank you. Okay, I have quite a number uh, on my list. Oh, there's you, please. The exactly, yes, you. No, not you, Jennifer. <laughs> Colleague behind you, sorry. Uh, Ilza Nogla, Latvian Television. I have a, president, a question for the Vice President Dombrovskis. Who is to replace Martin Selmayer as Secretary General, at least for now? Thank you. Well, uh, as regards uh, Secretary General, it's uh, uh, Ilze Johansson, so current Deputy Secretary General, who is uh, 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 replacing Martin Selmer and becoming ac uh, acting uh, uh, Secretary General. Okay, then I had next uh, actually Jennifer, yes. Thank you very much, Jennifer Rankin from The Guardian. And to return to uh, anti money laundering, um, the report identifies free ports uh, as, a, as a risk area, as a vulnerability for the EU when it, comes to anti, uh, when it comes to money laundering. Why is it only now that the Commission is looking at free ports as they've, they've existed for a long time? And can you give us a flavour of where you see the risks in free ports? And is it appropriate to have so many free ports in the European Union? And just a second question, if I may. Given the cross-border nature of what you are discussing, do you think the EU's current rules are Brexit-proof? Uh, well, I will probably uh, start with a um, uh, second question. Well, as regards uh, EU's anti-money uh, laundering uh, rules, uh, as we already were saying, uh, they are one of the strictest in the world. So uh, from uh, that point of view, I would say it's irregardless of uh, uh, Brexit that we have strong uh, anti-money laundering uh, legislation. So the question here is how this anti-money laundering uh, legislation is uh, being uh, applied. Uh, and uh, 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 that's what we are currently uh, concentrating on. So how to improve enforcement within the uh, EU. 
uh, of course, and there always uh, 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 remains a question that this uh, uh, money uh, being laundered often comes from the third countries or ends up in a third country. This is also a dimension which we are touching up into this uh, 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 report. Maybe Did you want to add reports. anything, Commissioner? Uh, on the reports, we, we are mentioning the new, new trends and, and the risks which are becoming more dangerous and which uh, are uh, achieving some, uh, how to say, critical mass of, of, of problems. So among uh, those new risks and new trends, we see virtual currencies, also the citizenship for sale, and you are right that the reports are mentioned there. This is not a new thing. But now we came to a conclusion after a thorough analysis of, of the issues uh, that it is worth mentioning and it, it is worth uh, spe specifically addressing in the report. So this is not a new thing, but we, want to, uh, uh, we, we wanted to analyze this issue and come uh, with uh, the explanation that this uh, is something we have to focus more on. Then I had Oliver, or that's cleared. Hi, here in the middle. Question to Commissioner Jourova. Which parts of the uh, implementation of the GDPR uh, cause the most worry for you? Wh which rights of the GDPR, in your view, are not sufficiently, uh, you know, uh, widespread amongst citizens' awareness, and what could be done about that? I'm specifically thinking about the right that you can actually know if a decision about you, for example, um, in the insurance market or in the labor market is being made by some automated um, algorithmic procedure. And I think y y you published a Europe barometer recently that shows that actually basically nobody knows about this, right? And it's getting more and more important. There's more and more aspects of our lives are being automatized. Thank you. Well, you came uh, at the same time with the answer. <laughs> because this is uh, the whole range of issues related to the informed consent uh, of, of the people because they uh, should know at every moment what's happening to their data, what's happening to their identity after they share their private data with some system. And uh, this is uh, the, the most difficult uh, thing also, I think, for the businesses to uh, comply with this strict rule, but we could not do otherwise than insist on well-informed uh, consent as the basic principle because we wanted to give back to the people the control over their data. And uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, gaining more uh, importance when we speak about the rules for artificial intelligence and the systems based on algorithms because in this we insist on having uh, the full transparency and having the, the good knowledge and having uh, good control over how the algorithm is set up and also to give the people the, the chance to know how the assessment uh, is, uh, is done. So the informed consent and to, to uh, compliance with this strict rule. Then speaking about the main issues in implementation, in some countries, as I said also in the speech, we, we see some kind of gold plating. Uh, some countries go beyond the, the G GDPR uh, to my taste too far, and then the, the people uh, cease to understand uh, uh, why GDPR is, is uh, setting some, some rules, because simply GDPR is a risk-based uh, uh, rule. So uh, when the countries go beyond and introduce uh, burdensome, unnecessary measures for some sectors. We see this as a problem. Then the third problem, which I see personally as a dangerous uh, indication or trend, in some countries we see that uh, uh, GDPR uh, appears in the crash with the freedom of media and, and uh, for right, right for information. We have to clarify with, with several states that uh, GDPR is not there to deprive the people of the right of information. Uh, so the, these are the three things uh, which are difficult. And when I said one continent, one law, uh, uh, we uh, still uh, work hard on, through ongoing dialogue with the member states, to keep the consistent application and not to go beyond what the GDPR wanted. Okay, then I had Jack, or that is cleared.
a follow up on Jennifer's question on free ports. Um, I, I just wondered if you had uh, specific concerns at the idea of new free ports being opened in Europe. Um, is this a, is this an issue that you'll continue to look at or will look at again? Um, and might there be um, guidelines or advice for any any existing or future free ports that might exist? Just very shortly, of course, the, the fact that we mentioned the free ports as the, the new emerging threat, this is the invitation for the follow-up and for looking more deeply into, into the issue and coming with the recommendation for the sector. Thank you. Okay, then I did have Matthew next. Good afternoon, Commissioner Matthew Newman from MLEX. Just to follow up on a previous question about uh, GDPR and implementation, uh, you mentioned several uh, difficulties that you see in uh, GDPR implementation, gold plating and such. Um, are you at all looking at letters of formal notice or any kind of uh, first steps in um, infringement procedure? And, and also in your speech, you mentioned uh, making it easier for businesses as a, as a priority for you. And this is uh, standard contractual contracts and code of conduct and that kind of thing. Um, I was wondering where you are with that. Uh, if you're thinking about doing uh, new model contracts, perhaps, with um, processor to processor, and um, when that might come out, if, if at all, maybe before the end of this mandate. And then finally, um, you mentioned the priority about uh, GDPR around the world as a standard. Uh, can you just give us an update? Which countries are the furthest advanced in your talks? with uh, adequacy or possible adequacy agreements. Thanks very much. We said from the beginning that we will not hesitate to launch the infringement procedure where needed. And that's why I, I said before that we are still in the dialogue with the member states trying to improve uh, the situation to uh, discourage some member states from adopting the, the, the national legislation where, where we uh, see the, the possible deviation. Uh, but in case uh, we will uh, see this necessary, of course we will, we will use the uh, legal uh, traditional process which, which might be even the, the letter of formal notice in some cases. Uh, on uh, the, how to help the businesses, of course, the certification, for instance, or the codes of conduct, these are the, the tools which might help uh, not only businesses in general, but specific sectors. Because after, also before GDPR came into force, we received tens of thousands of questions from the business world. And each of those questions were specific. It is simply not one size fits all. And uh, the risk-based approach means that each company has to assess its own risk because it is a specific situation. That's why we believe that more guidelines and more tools uh, like uh, certification and, and uh, codes of conduct will help. And here we rely on the data protection authorities who are in, in the touch uh, with reality uh, to uh, work intensively on, on these tools because this will be also help for them. Uh, if, uh, these tools will not work in practice. The avalanche of the questions will, will continue. And the, the last question, it was something I liked. <laughs> Contractual clauses? Yeah, it was it. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, we, we made a sort of analysis of the situation in the world, and there are more than 100 countries which now have the laws similar to uh, the GDPR. Uh, our main uh, comparison benchmark is whether the protection of privacy is recognized in the country as fundamental right. So uh, with such countries, we uh, engaged in uh, the dialogue, uh, we finalized Japanese uh, adequacy decision, which is a mutual one. Uh, we are on a good track in uh, South Korea. Uh, we want to do more with uh, Latin America. Uh, we have to uh, review all the current adequacy decisions. We have 11 states uh, 
uh, which have the laws which have to be compared with uh, the GDPR uh, in order to renew, uh, possibly renew the adequacy decision. Uh, so this is uh, the bilateral work, a very thorough analytical work. Uh, we uh, doing this, we see everywhere that the GDPR as the more and more important global standard is recognized. So uh, it's very logical that the, the EU is assessing the situation in other countries based on under GDPR. And by the way, the European Court of Justice said clearly that uh, to allow the data transfers from EU somewhere else, it requires to, to have the uh, essentially equivalent protection on, on the other place, which is the condition for possible adequacy, adequacy decision. But uh, more strategic vision might be the, this multilateral agreement, uh, which would create a big uh, worldwide uh, space for free flow of data with trust, which was the Japanese idea. I agree with it that this might be the, the good way forward, and which could also work as an intensive for the states which do not recognize the protection of privacy as fundamental right and which should be under more pressure from our side, from the side of those who uh, take this uh, very seriously. Thank you. Okay, then uh, two more questions because I think time is running out. Griselda was next. Merci beaucoup. C'est Griselda Pastor de la Radio Española SIR. Je poserai ma question en français. Oui. En fait, j'aurais aimé la poser à Monsieur le Commissaire Vela, qui n'est pas ici, je ne sais pas s'il est déjà en vacances, mais il y a un an, il a, il a convoqué le ministre de Neuf au gouvernement de l'Union pour leur expliquer l'importance de la politique environnementale et de la contamination ambientale dans les villes de, de l'Union. Puis après ça, il a renvoyé devant le tribunal de Luxembourg six de ces gouvernements. Demain, l'Espagne paraît-il qu'on va suivre aussi le même chemin J'aimerais savoir si vous sentez que la politique ambientale est un grave échec de votre commission. Ok, ce n'est pas vraiment lié au Secolage Readout, donc euh, et on ne peut même plus commenter sur de possibles infractions qui n'ont pas été discutées au Collège aujourd'hui. Donc je suggère qu'on revienne vers toi sur ces questions. Quand il est le temps, oui, Griselda Espagne, si vous voulez, où vous êtes presque à la fin de votre mandat. Il y a six de neuf gouvernements qui ont été convoqués pour Messie Vela, qui n'est pas ici aujourd'hui, euh, qui sont devant la cour. Euh, apparemment, la chose n'est pas finie. Ma question n'est pas à voir avec les infractions. J'aimerais savoir comment vous sentez la politique environnementale. Euh, Est-ce que vous considérez que c'est un échec de votre commission à ces moments présents je ne sais pas si un des commissaires veut prendre cette question. Je crois, encore une fois, c'est une question assez générale. Donc, euh, et les cours sont indépendants. S'il y a un cours de, de processus, un cours devant les cours, on ne va non plus les commenter. Donc, euh, je préfère de, aussi de donner la possibilité aux collègues qui ont des questions sur le thème d'aujourd'hui. Et c'était les collègues là. C'est prochain. OK. But Commissioner Oettinger, perhaps, still wants to add something. Peut-être nur deux courtes gedanken dazu. Le premier, Klimaschutz ist eine europäische Aufgabe geworden. Die Mitgliedstaaten anerkennen an, dass die Europäische Union hier gemeinsam auftritt, nach innen sich CO2-Emissionsreduktionsziele gesetzt hat und auch einhält, nach außen in Paris, in Marrakesch, in Katowice die starke Kraft für weltweiten Klimaschutz und für weltweite ehrgeistige Vereinbarungen geworden ist. Und zweitens, in meinem Haushaltsrahmen für dieses Jahrzehnt haben wir erstmals mit Mainstreaming ein 20% Klimaschutzziel ähm, vorgesehen und wir erreichen es. 20% unserer Ausgaben, 20 Cent pro Euro, müssen nachweisbar dem Klimaschutz gewidmet sein. Ich kenne keine vergleichbare Zielsetzung, die den Haushalt zum wichtigsten Instrument für Klimaschutz äh, macht. Dies werden wir im nächsten Jahrzehnt auf 15 Prozent steigern. Ich glaube, damit beweisen wir, dass wir bei großen Themen den Mehrwert Europas für Natur und Umwelt, für Klimaschutz auch entsprechend darlegen. Und dies war im Grunde genommen äh, verbunden mit der Juncker-Kommission. Okay, merci beaucoup. Alors, on passe à vous. 
Thank you. Samuel Stolton, you're active here. Um, going back to GDPR, uh, Commissioner, you're over. I'd like to know if you've got a message for Greece, Portugal and Slovenia who are actually yet to update their national rules to fall in line with GDPR and why do you think they've been dragging their feet in uh, making the changes? I have a message for them and they know it. Hurry up. Thank you. Thank you. Still wants to 